Welcome into Real Pod Wednesdays. I'm Dan Hope. He's Andy Anders on what will be a season defining week for the Ohio State men's basketball team as Ohio State is headed to the Big Ten tournament where it will play its first game against Iowa on Thursday. The Buckeyes, against all odds, earned a first round bye in the Big Ten tournament by winning five of their final six games of a regular season, which, Andy, is exactly what we said they needed to do to give themselves a chance going into the Big Ten tournament. And we're saying there's a chance. I, I, I do believe that this team has a real chance to make the NCAA tournament, but it has to win at least two games in Minneapolis this week, starting with a second-round game against Iowa on Thursday and then continuing with a quarterfinal game against Illinois, who's a top-15 team in the country on Friday. So uh, the path appears to be there for Ohio State, but actually accomplishing that path is certainly going to be easier said than done. Yeah, two games minimum, Dan. You know, I've uh, I've, I've got a story that went up on 11 Warriors this morning evaluating where Ohio State stands among a, a lot of the bubble teams uh, sort of in and around the tournament right now. And uh, there's certainly no chance if they don't beat Illinois, I don't think. Um, ultimately, you have to beat Iowa first to beat, then beat Illinois. But uh it there is uh just looking at the bubble this year it's it's pretty densely packed i mean even you you look at a team like uh colorado who's considered last four in by joe lenardi of espn jerry palm of cbs sports and the bracket matrix aggregator which uh takes i believe it's 114 projections now and looks at them all and combines the results um and just looking at that you know that's that's a, so that's a last consensus last four team in um Colorado is 27th in net rank. Uh, Ohio State's 54th. They have a 22 to nine record. Ohio State's is 19 and 12 at this point. They have seven quad two wins to Ohio State's two and only one fewer quad one loss. I mean, that's that's the kind of teams that you're trying to stack up against here. And to get in those discussions again, you need those two victories, and you probably need some help. You need some key teams to lose early in their conference tournaments because you got to keep in mind with the exception of indiana state pretty much every single bubble team is still also alive in their own conference tournaments which that is another loss that complicated things for ohio state unfortunately already complicated enough the tournament path but uh indiana state falling to drake in the missouri valley conference finals really added another layer to the bubble conversations um and an, another team that you know are are in a lot of those last four in areas uh on these projections i'm not a expert bracketologist by any means i don't know that you are either but the reality is there's only one way in which we will go into the ncaa tournament selection show knowing that Ohio State will make the NCAA tournament. And that is if Ohio State wins the Big Ten tournament just a few minutes before the bracket is revealed. Now, I don't think they have to win the Big Ten tournament to make the NCAA tournament, but anything short of that is going to leave you uncertain. I would think if Ohio State can win three games and make it to the championship game, that their chances would be quite good. I believe that, you know, even if they just win two games, that they have a strong argument in their favor, even if you just look at just recency. I mean, if, if they were to, let's say they were to hypothetically beat Iowa, Illinois, and then lose in the semifinals, they would have won seven of their last nine games at that point, clearly playing better than they were playing earlier in the year. They would have 21 total wins. They would be up to... Four Q1 wins, including uh, a, a win over Illinois that would join, you know, a win over Purdue, which could be the number one seed in the entire tournament if it wins the Big Ten tournament. Uh, you have a win over an Alabama team, which has gotten uh, stronger as the year has gone on. And so, you know, Ohio State has those big wins on its resume with the potential to add more this week to strengthen its resume. And that was something that Jake Diebler cited on Monday when he was asked whether Ohio State should be in the NCAA tournament conversation. A couple of our top wins would stack up against anybody in the country. And 
we've now stacked together some road wins. And, you know, also the momentum that we're, we have and the way we've been playing lately, I think there's a lot of positives that, you know, would, would help our case. But I, I would ab- absolutely be deserved to be in the conversation. And that includes the, the total body of work. A couple observations coming off of that, you know, sitting in the press conference, I think a lot of times one of the things I've really, really appreciated about Jake is his openness and honesty about some of these topics when he's talking to us. You never get the sense that he's being an authentic and, you know, not that a lot of coaches lie to you and pressers per se, but they won't give you the whole truth. They won't tell you about conversations that go on behind the scenes. Jake is really good about being open not only with us, but with Ohio State's team about embracing the stakes of games like these that are coming up. And I I think that plays into some of it here where, you know, um, he's willing to stand behind his guys and say, absolutely, we should be in this discussion. I I think, you know, and this isn't necessarily another knock on Chris Holtman. There's other there's plenty of things we can knock Chris Holtman for. uh, you know, given uh, how his tenure unfolded and everything. But I, I think, you know, Chris wouldn't – I don't think this is something Chris would have said. Um, and that's, you know, each coach has his own approach to the media. That's to each their own. But to, to be this confident about, yeah, we deserve – a shot we deserve to be in the conversation i i really liked it from jake and i think it's something you know standing by your team that i'm sure players appreciate as well um as far as how you actually get there you know like he said he hasn't dove into all the metrics to your point dan i think late season momentum is super important in in these um in just how you enter tournaments, how you make your run through the conference tournament. You know, you, you want to be entering your conference tournament on a, on a winning streak rather than a losing streak. And Ohio State is right now, four-game winning streak. Putting that aside, though, I'm not sure how much the selection committee is going to weigh when you look at Ohio State. Hey, they've made this great run since Jake Diebler was hired. And this is, again, assuming they win those two games because, again, they don't have a case. So we're, we're just going to operate under the assumption that they win those first two games in the tournament because I, 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 there's just not much of a shot without it when you're talking NCAA tournament. But assuming they win those two games, the, the, turn, the committee is supposed to look at the full body of work of a season. And so you wonder how much that run influences them. Does it give Ohio State a leg up? I'm not so sure. But if if it does, if that is something the committee is going to look at and take into account, I think it can be a separator for them from other bubble teams who maybe didn't close their seasons as strong. Hard because I think we would probably both agree right now. The way Ohio State has played since Jake Diebler took over, Ohio State has been one of the 68 best teams in college basketball, right? Mm-hmm. Right, but absolutely. Were they over the entire body of work of a season? That's that's hard to say right now, and it, it it certainly is going to depend in large part on how this week goes. Like you said, it's going to depend in part on how the week goes for all of those many other bubble teams too. And so, you know, we might have a clearer pick. Like, you know, let's say Ohio State does lose on Saturday. Then in that scenario, then we'll be able to then kind of look at the bubble again, and we might have a better idea going into Sunday of what Ohio State's chances are of actually getting in the field. Either way, if if, if they you know win you know two or three games in a Big Ten tournament, it's going to be close. Like there's going to be intrigue going into Selection Sunday on whether or not Ohio State is going to make it. The good news is Ohio State has given itself a chance, which. The way things looked a few weeks ago, it didn't even feel like we would be having this conversation. You know, a few weeks ago, it felt like we would be just be talking about this is going to be the last week of Chris Holtman's tenure, and then it's going to be a new era for Ohio State basketball. Now we're talking about, hey, Jake Diebler has has injected some energy into this team, and, and they've got a chance to maybe make a run here this week that gets them into the NCAA tournament. And certainly, when you look at why they've been able to do that, I think one of the biggest differences you can look at is their defense, which you highlighted in an article on 11 Warriors earlier this week. In their first 27 games this year, the Buckeyes allowed 75.9 points per game. In their last four, they've allowed only 59.5 points per game. And it's going to be very important for that 
kind of defensive play to continue this week because when you look at the teams that they are going to play if they advance to at least the quarterfinals, Illinois is the second highest scoring team in the Big Ten, and Iowa is third. And so Ohio State's defense is going to have to be on point if the Buckeyes are going to make a run in Minneapolis. Yeah, um, one of a few things that I think are going to be really critical to a, a lengthened Big Ten tournament run, I think the way that Jake Giebler has deployed his depth the last few weeks has been crucial to their success in a lot of ways to sustain that that aggressive play style they want to sustain, but they're going to need those depth guys to be on point. You know, when you, anytime you talk about a tournament like this, when you're playing on back to back to back days, potentially uh, you, you need to roll guys deep. You need to keep legs fresh. That's why I think, you know, that's an underappreciated part of getting that first round by. I know when they got it, there was a lot of conversation about, did you actually want to play on day one so that you could pick up an extra win for the NCAA tournament resume? Not sure how much a win over last place Michigan would have helped them um, on a neutral floor, but you'd rather have those fresher legs and not having to play in that first round game um, to move forward and then hopefully pick up quadrant one wins over Illinois. And if you get to the semis, likely Nebraska, Nebraska would have to win a a game to get there, but Nebraska would also be a quadrant one win for Ohio State. And and you're starting to stack those a little more. so, uh, the defense, for me, the main difference maker has, again, been that aggressive mentality um, that they brought on both ends of the floor. Ohio State turning teams over at a higher rate. The fast break numbers have almost doubled in terms of fast break points per game from when Jake Diebler took over to what they were under Chris Holtman. I believe it's only 5.8 points per game under Chris Holtman, and they're averaging more than 11 fast break points per game right now uh, under Jake Diebler. It's not been huge tweaks to the system. Ohio State's running a lot of the same sets offensively and defensively, but it's just they're pressing out more, incorporating more press defense down the court, uh, seeking more turnovers, blocking more shots. Sometimes even it feels like they had a, a really nice game in terms of block shots at Rutgers there. Um, and also staying in the fight, uh, Jake made a great point. I thought in the press conference he had on Monday about Ohio state didn't let the offensive laws it had at Rutgers because there were stretches of that game where they struggled on the offensive end, not so much in the second half. They've had big second halves against both Michigan and Rutgers. Uh, but in the first half, at least they had some stretches where they really struggled on the offensive end, but they didn't let it affect their defense. You know, there was these times under Holtman where it just felt like everything would go wrong. And against Rutgers, at least when you hit those walls offensively, they still stayed on point defensively, kept their attention to detail. Um, and and so I, I think those are the biggest areas where Ohio State has taken strides entering this Big Ten tournament. And why I really like their chances against Iowa, given they only lost by two points on the road earlier this season. Iowa's a different team now, but uh, I, I think that these are this is a really these are two teams that are both on the bubble. Iowa itself is right on the NCAA tournament bubble at the moment, so Ohio State can kind of knock out a contender by beating Iowa on Thursday. That so that's going to be really interesting to see wh- exactly how Ohio State can take these changes that's made down the late season stretch and can you carry them over and and really make this postseason run. Iowa's not going to be a pushover, and you know I think you look at Iowa and Illinois. They're both the kind of teams that Ohio State has tended to struggle with. They're they're long teams. They have a lot of scores. So, again, we talk about the defensive growth. We do have to qualify that with they just played Michigan and Rutgers. These two teams are a lot better than Michigan and Rutgers. And to your point, because I do think there's some people out there who think Ohio State would have been better off not getting the first round by. I don't believe that to be the case at all because Michigan is 8-23. and And the committee doesn't care as much about total wins as it cares about quality wins. And that's why you're going to see, you know, mid-major, you know, an Indiana state, for example, they're a bubble team. They have 28 wins. They're a bubble team because they didn't win their conference tournament because they didn't play as many high major teams. And so the committee cares more about quality wins, two wins over Michigan and Iowa would not at all be the same as two wins over Iowa and Illinois. The path, would have still been the same. Ohio State just would have had to win 
at least three games to get there instead of at least two. And so I actually think the draw worked out perfectly for Ohio State the way Sunday went, because if they had ended up getting the nine seed, then they would know to win two games, you have to beat Purdue. And Ohio State did beat Purdue once. They lost They lost to Illinois by 12, both games at home. So you could make an argument that maybe they'd be better off against Purdue, but the way Purdue's playing, they're a potential number one overall seed. You know, you, you got to think beating Purdue twice is going to be a hard task. So I think the way that the bracket played out for Ohio State actually played out very well for Ohio State in the sense of, you know, you have the chance to, you know, starting with Iowa on Thursday, you know, you have the chance to go get, you know, at least two quality wins here. And I think they're both winnable games. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to be, I mean, I think, I don't know what the line will be exactly for Ohio State, Iowa, but I know like I was looking on ESPN and their analytics thing basically had it as like a 50 50 game. So, like, that game's kind of a toss up. Like you said, Iowa is going to be just as desperate in Ohio St- as Ohio State in that game because if Iowa loses that game, they're probably not in the, the NCAA tournament. So uh, that both those teams are going to have everything to play for in that game. And then certainly Illinois. I mean, you look at all the metrics. They're, they're 10th in Ken Palm. They're, they're 13th in the AP poll. They're 15th in the net rankings. That's not going to be an easy game. So uh, the, the path is not easy here for Ohio State, but – the way that Jake Diebler has gotten this team playing makes you feel like any game is winnable. You know, and I think the way that they finished games, the way that they've shown that when the game is on the line, you know, you go back to the Michigan state game and, you know, being able to come back in the second half and pull that one out at the buzzer, you know, to win that game where we have seen so many games, especially late in Chris Holtman's tenure where the team would wilt down the stretch. And then, the last two games, again, you have to qualify it with it was Michigan and Rutgers, but to just dominate those games in the second half and take control the way they did. It's what you want to see, and it feels like this team you know, is peaking at the right time here going into the conference tournament. And so you know, it, it's going to be an, an interesting week in, in Minneapolis, but it, it's certainly uh, a much – Better thing if you're an Ohio State fan to, you know, at least go into this tournament feeling like, hey, we've got a shot rather than feeling like we need an absolute mirror. I I think toward the end of Chris Holtman's tenure, the word I kept using was apathy. And I think there's the opposite of that now in this fan base. People are very interested. I think they're galvanized uh, in a lot of ways by the energy that this coaching transition has provided to the team, to the program. Um, and, and there's real intrigue now in watching Ohio State basketball. And even if they ultimately lose to Iowa on Thursday and uh, end up going to the NIT, I, I think that there's it's very commendable what Jake Diebler has done here. He's coached his way into what I would assume to be at least a – uh, mid-major job, but Dan, there's a lot of people already calling for Jake to be in the permanent head coaching discussion. Now, we've talked about that before, and I think that you know we're still of the opinion that Jake's going to need to win more games, especially with a new athletic director coming in than what he's done so far, and that un- unlikely still NCAA tournament run might be required, and then not only that, but winning some games at the tourney um, to, to get him real consideration. Still, uh, he's he's definitely turned some heads. But we found out more about the coaching search in the last few weeks generally. Um, one from multiple sources that we've heard now is that Dusty May is emerging as the front runner, whereas might have been hearing more Sean Miller before. Um, I think Indiana saying that it is sticking with Mike Woodson next season really, really helped Ohio State's push here uh, for Dusty May. And, we, you know, again, we've talked about it. it that's our that's our pick for this hire. So I, I think we think that's the right direction for Ohio State to go with this. But uh, Dan, thoughts on how the coaching search has evolved over the last few weeks here? Yeah, well, you know, you mentioned Jake Diebler, and I, I do think, like, you know, if you polled Ohio State fans right now, he might be the most popular choice. And that just speaks to how well the team has played the last few weeks, how impressive this turnaround has been under Jake Diebler. And so I think 
that support from fans is well-deserved and well-reasoned. With that being said, there hasn't really been a whole lot of buzz feeling that he's someone that's really emerged as a, a front runner in this coaching race yet. You know, like I said, Dusty May, Sean Miller, those are the two names that have kind of been in this thing from the start. And it feels like they're still both very much in this thing. Um, one of our staffers also heard earlier this week that Nate Oates is also getting some consideration from Alabama. And uh, it's uncertain whether he would want to leave Alabama to to come to Ohio State. But uh, he's a guy that is also emerging as a potential candidate in this coaching search and so you know if I was handicapping it right now if I was setting the betting odds I think Dusty May is probably the betting favorite for this job at this point and and like you said I mean I, to me I think that would be a very good hire like he was the guy like when I started thinking about coaching candidates week before weeks before Chris Holtman was even fired he was the first name that came to mind for me because of what he's been able to do at Florida Atlantic over the last couple of years. And you got to think if he can do that at Florida Atlantic, if he could take Florida Atlantic to a final four a, a school where he's not getting a ton of top recruits, but he's just managed to build a team that is really good. If he can do that there, then think about what he should be able to do. If you put him in a high resource program, like Ohio state. Now the counterpoint of that is some people look at dusty may and say, well, he's never been a head coach at a high major program. Is he a better choice than Sean Miller, who's proven, you know, he can bring in top 10 recruiting classes, that he can consistently make NCAA tournaments and sweet 16s at Arizona. Is he a better choice than Nate Oates, who's, you know, Alabama teams have been, you know, among the more exciting teams in the country the last few years have been, you know, very explosive offensively and have, have shown they can win at a high level. You know, I, you, you did an article uh, for 11 Warriors on Tuesday, kind of weighing the pros and cons of, the four coaches who we believe are legitimate candidates for the job at this point, which those once again are Dusty May, Sean Miller, Nate Oates, and Jake Diebler. And I think there's legitimate pros and cons you can weigh with all of these guys. You know, if, you know, Sean Miller, Nate Oates, there's some, you know, off court questions that you've got to uh, sift through too. As we've said before, I don't really think those things are going to scare off Ross Bjork because I think Ross Bjork is a risk taker. And I think he, he's not going to cross someone off the list just because they might have a little bit of baggage on their record. And, you know, both those guys, you can argue like, you know, with, with Nate Oates, a lot of it stems from uh, the whole uh, Darius miles, Braden, Brandon Miller situation at Alabama last year. And he made some comments after uh, Darius miles was, was charged with capital murder and a shooting that uh, did not go over well. And, and he had to, apologized for those comments but is you know that one mistake the way he handled that one situation going to disqualify him from this job probably not if Ross Bjork in Ohio State believes he's uh, got all the right qualifications for the job you know Sean Miller you know there's obviously was with the FBI investigation there's also the fact that Xavier is not very good this year and so I think uh, you, you could look at a Dusty Mayer and Nate Oates whose teams are you know going to be in the NCAA tournament this year and those guys might be a little bit more appealing than someone whose team is, unless they win the Big East tournament this year, this week, not going to make the NCAA tournament. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's pros and cons to weigh with all of them. And that includes Jake Diebler. I mean, there's the, the pros of Jake Diebler. I mean, for one, everything we've heard is boosters like Jake Diebler. Jake Diebler uh, has a lot of support from people who, have influence over Ohio State basketball and bringing money into the Ohio State basketball program. And relationships go a long way in coaching. So I, I think that keeps Jake Diebler in this conversation, the fact that he has made a very good impression on people within Columbus, including people who have influence in Columbus. Also, the fact that he clearly seems to be very well liked by his players. And so you think about roster retention, you know, most likely promoting Diebler is going to be the guy who gives you the best chance of retaining the key pieces on your roster that you want to keep around. The, the cons there are pretty obvious. He's never been a permanent head coach anywhere 
we really don't know like what what is an off season going to look like under Jake Diebler when you know he 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 was a very key effort of Ohio State's recruiting efforts over the last couple of years. So I don't really have any doubt that he can recruit at a high level, but it's different when you're the assistant versus when you're sitting in the head chair. And, you know, how can he navigate the transfer portal? How can he navigate NIL and all the things, you know, we've talked about Ryan Day being a CEO of a football program. When you become the permanent head coach, now you have to be the CEO of a basketball program. How can can Jake Diebler handle all of those things? First impressions have been very good, but it's still a risk to, to take a guy that's never actually been in that role on a full-time basis and then give him the keys to a program that we both agree. I certainly think all of our listeners agree. This is a program that should be contending for Big Ten titles and ultimately national titles. Now. The expectation should not be that that's going to happen necessarily next year with a new head coach. But ultimately, when you make this hire, you have to look at which one of these coaches that we can get do we think is going to make our program the best in the next three to five years. It, it can't just be about next year and next year's roster. It has to be about who is going to be able to build this program to get it to where it should be, which is, you know, consistently contending to be a top 25 team, a, a, a big 10 contender and consistently making the NCAA tournament. You know, those are very realistic expectations at Ohio state. And you, you have to make sure that whoever you hire is capable of getting them there. Dusty May has shown that in the last couple of years at Florida Atlantic. Sean Miller and Nate Oates have certainly shown that in their history across multiple schools. Jake Diebler hasn't proven that yet. There's, there's reason to believe there is a, a promising future for Jake Diebler. And like you said, I, I believe Jake Diebler will be a head coach somewhere next year. I believe Jake Diebler will do well wherever he's a head coach because, uh, the signs so far have been very promising. It's just a question of whether that should be at Ohio State right now as somebody who's never been a full-time head coach before. Right. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of talk about, you know, just sign him to a one-year prove-it deal. Sign him to a shorter, maybe like a three-year deal with a low buyout. And and the caution against that is, you know, it hurts. It kind of handicaps someone as a recruiter when the program isn't showing that long-term commitment to you. And, you know, it, it, you can it's still Ohio State. You can still sell Ohio State to recruits. I get it. But, uh, you know, this isn't Duke. This isn't North Carolina. This isn't Ohio State football. You're not a true blue blood. You know, you're, you're right in that next tier of teams, but you're not a true blue blood. And so I don't think Ohio State sells itself in the way on the basketball court that certain other programs do. There's still a certain echelon of talent. Ohio State can just say, yeah, we're Ohio State. We're going to get this guy. Uh, but it's not like football where, you know, I think there's, there's a certain number of recruits who would give Ohio State a serious look regardless of who the head coach is and regardless of the program's commitment to that coach. Uh, I think in basketball, it's just a little different recruiting for Ohio State. And so, you know, that's the risk of trying to sort of sit on your hands a little bit with with Jake Diebler and figure out with a full season if he could be the guy. I, I don't think you want to waste that time um, if you feel like, you know, if you don't feel confident that he is is the guy. If you're going to rebuild with someone who's already proven they can do it, like a Dusty May, like a Sean Miller, potentially like a Nate Oates. You want to start that as soon as possible. And um, so so from my perspective, I don't like the idea of just keeping Jake around um, on a, a short term short term deal like that. If you're going to make a commitment to the guy, make a commitment to the guy. He doesn't need to be a Chris Holtman six year extension with millions and millions of dollars on it. I'm not saying that, but y you need to give him a true longer term commitment for recruiting purposes. If 
he proves to be the guy you really want. And, you know, it's important to have the backing of boosters, the backing of fans. Like we said, I, I agree with you, Dan. If we polled fans today, I think I'm a, the, the largest percentage of votes for who should be Ohio State's next coach would probably go to Jake Diebler right now. Just even from what I've seen on in, in, on Twitter and our 11 Warriors comment sections. But administrators have to have this perspective of – Ultimately, this is just a six-game run that that Ohio State's been on. As great as they've turned things around under Diebler, as refreshing as it is to see this team play with some energy and win basketball games and not fall apart down the stretch when they've done it for the past two seasons, you have to take a breath and say, hey, how sustainable is this, right? You, you, You don't know. You don't know because the guy that's leading the charge doesn't have a track record um, yet. It, like you said, I, I fully believe he's going to go somewhere, and I really think Jake Diebler could be a great head coach someday. But I, I, unless, again, there's more achieved at the end of the season where he says, no, I am the head coach of this team, you know, I think, again, that Sweet 16 is kind of where you, you really start to look at it uh, realistically. Uh then I think you you want to go in the direction of more of that experienced hand or proven hand in, in Dusty May or Nate Oates or uh, Sean Miller. Getting back into some of the pros and cons of those guys, like you said, I, I think, you know, Dusty May, um, the, the lack of high major experience for me, um, it doesn't sit, it doesn't weigh as heavily as you know, I think we've heard maybe some boosters behind the scenes have hesitations about um, Dusty May's lack of high major experience because he's shown he can develop players. When Chris Holtman was coming in from Butler, you know he'd only been there a few years, and I I just didn't get the sense that while he shown improvements and uh, taken that program from a really bad low after losing Brad Stevens to where it was when he left there wasn't this i think player development was one of chris holtman's two biggest shortcomings for me during his tenure here and dusty may has shown he can develop guys at florida atlantic i mean you look at like a guy like vladislav golden who transferred in from texas tech was basically a no-name player and he's turned into a superstar for them and uh just the way that players have grown under his tutelage that's the advantage of coaching in a mid-major is you get to demonstrate how over time you can develop talent um and e- even if he's only been doing it for six years as a head coach there's uh, I think from a player development side, that's one of the most attractive things for me about Dusty May. And he sustained it. It's not they went on that magical final four run last year after having a fantastic season, but they're having another great year this year. They're going to be in the tournament. They, they'll have a good shot to win multiple games there. They've been ranked most of the season. Um, I, I think that that's the main pro for me of, of Dusty May. And I think the cons of that aren't too much of a drawback. And I think for me, Nate Oates is kind of right uh, in that same uh, the Darius Miles, Brandon Miller stuff. Hard to judge exactly how much you place on Nate Oates for what was an awful off-court situation for Alabama last year. Um, obviously, some of the comments afterward were a little short-sighted, and he apologized for that. Uh, but on the court... I mean, Nate Oates plays a really exciting brand of basketball. Alabama has been one of the best offenses in the country year in, year out the last few years. And so um, he, he's he's started to recruit really well there, had th- top 20 classes the last three years. There weren't many on-court drawbacks to Nate Oates as I researched for that article. Um, outside some defensive inconsistencies, they they were really good defensively last year, but this year, uh, the year before last, not so much. They were they were bottom half of college basketball in terms of points allowed per 100 possessions. So, um, those are sort of like you you, wor- you worry a little bit about the defensive side, but man, if you you know what with Nate Oates, team is going to shoot the hell out of the basketball. Uh, they're going to get a score a lot of points, and he's going to recruit to that. So for me, when you're talking about this, I, I even put him ahead of Sean Miller. Miller, you know, 
uh, from a roster retention perspective, I'm, he doesn't have that reputation as a player's coach as much. Uh, not that roster retention is like, I, I don't even think a top five item you look at in the search because like, it, you know, it, it'd be nice to keep some of the stars you already have in place. But like you said, they're building for three to five years. And they're not, this isn't just about next year. But Sean Miller, for me, I, I can remember as a kid just feeling like Arizona. Yeah, they were consistently getting to sweet 16s, but they never saw a final four under him despite having gobs of five star talent. Uh, for, for me, I, I always felt like Arizona could never clear a certain threat threshold under Sean Miller. And I also felt like based off the recruits they were getting based off Arizona being a little more of a traditional blue blood than Ohio State in basketball could had a, maybe a slightly higher ceiling even. So I, I wonder what Sean Miller Ohio State looks like long term, but you, you know that there's a certain floor with him, too, because of the long track record he has. I don't expect Ohio State to miss many NCAA tournaments under Sean Miller. And, and there's a certain, you know, relief knowing that you have a guy in place that, that's at least going to get you to that level every year. So we, we both spent very long segments there talking about these coaches, but it's, it's just how interesting this search is and the variety of candidates that have come forward. There's a number. Each of these four guys presents a very different direction for this program to go down and it ultimately all comes down to ross bjork and what he thinks is the best direction for this program um and that in and of itself is very intriguing long term ross bjork is athletic director what is important to him in the hiring process for a coach yeah and ross bjork has to make a decision with conviction here i mean this is your your first Big hire. Now, that doesn't mean you should give a 10 million, a 10 year fully guaranteed contract to a coach like you did with Jimbo Fisher. But the, the one year prove it deal, that should be a complete non starter. You can you cannot do that. You have if you if you want to hire Jake Diebler, you have to commit to him. If you were to make that move, you would have to throw your support behind him and say, he's our guy. He's proven that he can be our guy. And we believe he's going to be our guy for a long time. You, you, you cannot make this hire on a well, Jake did some good things, so we'll give him a year and see how he does. You, you have to make a hire with conviction. And so, as we talked about, most likely this is going to lean toward a more experienced coach. I certainly don't rule Jake Diebler out. This week is going to determine a lot of that because, you know, if, if Ohio State loses against Iowa, then as fun as the Jake Diebler story has been, I, I think that would that would bring an end to the idea of Jake Diebler becoming the next head coach. And this thing could start to really accelerate even by the time we're talking next week if Ohio State doesn't make the NCAA tournament. Because if, if Ohio State does make the NCAA tournament, then you wouldn't expect any real movement until after Ohio State's NCAA tournament run is over because you know that would be a distraction to what Jake Diebler and this team are trying to accomplish if you were to go hire another coach to be your head coach. But if Ohio State makes the NIT, yeah, they'll still have some games to play, but that's not going to stop. Uh, a potential coaching search from ramping up. I mean, it might not stop guys from entering the transfer portal either. So this week is certainly going to determine some of how we're talking about this situation next week based on whether Ohio State still has something real and tangible to play for this season or if it, it's better to make the NIT even to not, which like Ohio State didn't last year, but it's, it's still kind of an exhibition at the end of the day. And so uh, I think... It's a good thing that Ohio State will at least make the NIT to at least have some more games and, you know, for the young players that you hope will stick around to get them some more experience. But uh, ultimately, it's about making the NCAA tournament or not making the NCAA tournament. And this week, a, a very big week to determine that. Uh, starting Thursday, when Ohio State will play Iowa on Big Ten Network at 6.30 p.m. Let's talk about some football here. We learned. Some interesting stuff, I think, this past Thursday when Jim Knowles and eight of his defensive veterans met with the media. And I think maybe the most interesting thing we heard from that interview session is Jim Knowles revealing that he is considering adding a, a quote-unquote double eagle package to the defense in which Jack Sawyer and JT Tuamolowau would be used as outside linebackers. You know, with a guy like Hero, if he starts to really come along, you know, you start to look at some, uh, you know, double eagle type of packaging. You know, my thoughts are, you know, with the, with Jack and JT, 
you know, that at some point um, I want to train them as outside linebackers, you know, so if you got hero tie you can tie and you get to you can get to more of, you know, uh, you know, five five guys, five D linemen in the game, you know, with training guys like Jack and and uh, JT and Kenyatta, you know. It's kind of just kind of in my thoughts. Like if we're strong inside, those those guys can become more multiple. You know, I, I think it's techniques and things that they can use when they get to the next level. So that's kind of in my thoughts. You heard him mention Hero there in that answer. That revelation actually came up in response to him being asked about uh, Hero Canoe and what he's done to get himself on the field. And so, you know, that could be some of the impetus for that is, you know, potentially getting, you know, three defensive tackles on the field with Tyleek Williams, Ty Hamilton, and Hero Canoe. But, you know, interesting to hear the idea of potentially, you know, using Jack Sawyer and or JT to a Molo out in that outside linebacker role, because we saw Jim Knowles use the Jack position back in 2022. Jack Sawyer was one of the guys who played that role along with Javante Jean Baptiste. And then the Jack completely went away last year. Uh, they didn't use it at all. And now this is another wrinkle that Jim Knowles is considering adding to the defense. Now, there's no guarantee that it will actually happen. He said even at the time they haven't installed that yet. And so this could just prove to be an idea in the spring that they don't actually use in the fall. I mean, we've certainly seen that before on the defensive side of the ball at Ohio state. I mean, the Jack never became the big thing that it was expected to be when Jim Knowles started at Ohio state. I think back to the bullet. I think that was back when uh, Greg Madison uh, and Jeff Halfley started at Ohio state. There was a, a lot made of the bullet and Brendan white was going to play that position. Mm-hmm. And then they didn't really end up using that either. And so I tend to lean toward thinking this is a fun idea we're talking about now that we might not actually see a whole lot of this fall, but it's still interesting to hear him say it because, you know, I I do think that Jack kind of struggled with that Jack position back in 2022. And I guess the question is like, is this a package that would actually help Ohio state's defense or is it just adding an unnecessary wrinkle to a defense that really should just be able to line up with its base 11 and be dominant this year. The more I thought about it, you know, it's funny. It kind of brings me back to my high school days. My, my high school defense, we ran a five, two. Um, that was our base where you had a stand up linebacker on the end who had, who's mainly there for, um, to defend the run, to, um, rush the quarterback, but then also had some, coverage responsibilities of a tight end goes out for a route or something i think you know the way this is also, this is going to look i think for people maybe that are unfamiliar with this kind of package is you'll have the three defensive tackles with a hand in the dirt you'll have a defensive end either jt to emolo or jack sawyer with a hand in the dirt and then you'll have that stand up outside linebacker uh who you know you you kind of shift it based on the offensive front you're seeing usually to the tight end side um and i i kind of this is an idea that I think is definitely more like you'd see it against some of those heavier run teams like a Michigan people that like to go 12 personnel, multiple tight ends. Um, I, I, the, the hesitation that I have with it, like you said, Dan, and again, to your point, who, who knows how much this will actually be deployed in the fall. We, we've heard a number of ideas from Jim Doles uh, over the last couple of seasons. Some we've seen play out, some haven't. Um, you know, like the Jack position last year using, uh, you know, the talk was with Mitchell Melton and CJ Hicks, and the, the, that never came to fruition, right? So we, you, you always you take this with, with that in mind. But um, I, I think Jack, maybe with a year, has added back to his toolbox some ability to – go from a two point stance and play in space. Now he did, he did do some two point stuff last year, not from like an outside linebacker position, more like true defensive end, just standing up to maybe change kind of the angle of a pass rush or something. Um, But it was rare. And he definitely had his, you know, biggest results against Missouri from that three point. 
I also think about Chase Young and what they did with some of the predator pa- predator package stuff in 2019, um, standing him up and moving him around the formation. But this doesn't feel like that as much. I, I honestly, the biggest takeaway I have from that segment is that Ohio State likes its defensive tackle depth this year. If you're talking about getting three guys on the field, Hero was someone who always had this kind of upside. Um, as a player, but hadn't been playing football as long as some others on Ohio State's roster coming from Germany. And I, I, I really like what his physical tools were coming in. Caden McDonald, another guy that, you know, I know we're really high on and stood out as someone really physically impressive to me just in the short periods of spring practice we got to watch. You know, you don't get to see any 11 on 11 action there really, but you, you, you just seeing how he looks, how he moves the power, um, the first step that he has. I, I think Caden McDonald is another reason you might consider a package like this to get more defensive tackles on the field. And, you know, for NFL draft stock, I think even it's, it's enticing to a Jack Sawyer and a JT to him allow to show they can do that on tape, but, is it ultimately what's best for them? Jim Knowles and Larry Johnson might have some disagreements on that. Who's to say? I, uh, I, I'm i curious to see if this is something we see come fall. And even what Ohio State does defensively in the spring game, is it mostly vanilla? Do they go off the wall just It'll to be even... Mostly vanilla because it's a spring probably, game. Probably mostly vanilla because it's a spring game. But, uh, you know, I, I there, there's there's part of me that thinks, you know, Jim, the, Jim Knowles has the sense of humor knowing the defense he has might throw some stuff on the field where you're just like, what? And just like from a package perspective, you know, mixing different personnels and things. Um, but obviously, I don't think they're going to un Unveil a lot of different blitzes uh, against an offense that is still trying to figure things out. But uh, curious to see if we see anything different there. But as far as the double eagle package goes, uh, I, I'm I'm cautiously curious. I guess you could say. Yeah, you mentioned the the depth there on on defense and you know getting more guys involved. And I do think you know that's part of why he brought this up. And I think my question on that would be then are Jack and JT necessarily the best guys to play that role? You know, what about a guy like a Kenyatta Jackson, who's got, you know, the physical attributes where maybe he could be a guy who could play that, you know, rush linebacker role pretty well, or, you know, is that a role that a CJ Hicks or a Sonny Styles could play? Because we know that both of those guys are, uh, competing right now at that will linebacker spot. And Jim Knowles did say that, you know, he thinks there's going to be situations where those guys are both going to be on the field. And and that will probably look more like a traditional for free. We've seen Sonny already play that Sam linebacker position. So I think, you know, it's probably pretty likely we're going to see packages this year where he's playing Sam and, and CJ Hicks is playing Will and Cody Simon is playing Mike. And I think the double Eagle thing would be kind of more of a variation off of that rather than a typical four free, which we've, we've already seen them use against, you know, 12 personnel when, when teams have uh, been more, you know, heavier packages run oriented kind of offenses. Uh, it does sound based on what Jim Knowles said, like they are fully committed to Sonny Styles being a linebacker at this point. They're still going to move him around. They're still going to utilize his skill set. But I think you just look at how Sonny has transformed physically, you know, his size. Uh, I mean, he's just too big to be a safety at this point. Like he, he is a linebacker. Like everything about him physically is linebacker. And so uh, I think it's the right move for him. And I think he's certainly a guy that, uh, gives them the ability to, you know, do a lot of different things with him at that linebacker position. And I, I, I mean, I am curious too, to whether, you know, you talk about having those guys on a field together, you know, could there be situations where we see just Sonny Styles and CJ Hicks on the field together in, in a nickel package? Because, you know, I talked about it last year. I always thought like getting some more athletes on the field at that linebacker position could be a good idea in some of those pass coverage situations. Now, I don't really think Cody Simon's a guy who's going to leave the field much this year, much like, you know, Tommy Eichenberg when he was healthy last year. I think he's, he's going to be the guy. I think especially when you think about the new helmet rule that's going to go into effect, 
you know, he's probably going to be that guy with the, the green dot, as they would call it in the NFL. He's probably going to be that guy calling out the signals to the defense. And so I don't think we're going to see Cody Simon leave the field very often from that Mike linebacker spot. But I do think when you have two athletes of Sonny Styles and CJ Hicks's caliber, that there are some different things that you can do from that linebacker position, uh, some different upside that those guys bring that may allow you to do some different things, you know, even with just, you know, two or with three linebackers on the field that may look a little different than what you were doing with a, you know, Tommy Eichenberg, Steel Chambers, Cody Simon, top three linebacker trio. I think that's an excellent point. You know, Cody Simon's a much better run defender than he is a pass defender, I think. And um, I think CJ Hicks coming in, like I, I even reflect back on uh, just what he did in the on the camp circuit as a recruit, covering running backs, covering tight ends. He's always been great, you know, with that athleticism kind of in space covering guys. Sonny Styles, obviously now with a safety background coming to linebacker, I think, whereas coverage was kind of a weakness as a safety. It'll probably be a strength as a linebacker when you're matching him up against those running backs, those tight ends, um, more skiff zones, more hooks and curls than, um, you know, having to drop deep and play, uh, you know, sort of that center fielder as a safety, you know, uh, not that you're doing that as much as a bandit, but you are having, you have some deep zones, you have uh, some matchups with slot receivers, things of, things of that nature. Like you said, a pass rush specialist package or a pass down specialist package with CJ Hicks and Sonny Styles would make a lot of sense from that perspective. Um, I, to your point, too, Cody Simon is going to be leading the charge at linebacker. So we'll see how much that actually plays out. A guy that on this defense that you always love talking to that I found a lot of intrigue talking to, especially uh, this past week was Denzel Burke. I mean, it, it, this guy, I, I'm not sure he has an inauthentic bone in his body. I, I'm sure uh, Ohio State's sports information director, Jerry Emig, uh, isn't always a fan of what Denzel has to say, but he uh, speaks his truth. Uh, a guy who, uh, you know, certainly isn't willing to shy away from what he expects for Ohio State in 2024. Yeah, it's definitely uh, not your bus, man. That's our mentality. Um, you know, no excuses, man. We got to win it all. We got to win it all. And that's what we've been trying to, we've been trying to preach that every single day. And um, you know, our goal is to go out there every Saturday, hold each other accountable, play hard and make plays and turn the ball over. Yeah, you followed up with him after that clip too. You're like, isn't that a lot of pressure to put on yourself? He said, well, pressure makes diamonds. So that that's just who Denzel is. Um, he's very confident. And I think he plays a position probably more than any other where you have to be confident because you know, you're, you're a guy like him. He's most of the time he's out there on an Island one-on-one -on -one against the other team's best receiver. You got to be confident. You got to have that mentality that I'm not going to let this guy get open. And then even when the guy does get open and makes a play on you, you got to be able to come right back the next play and say, I'm not going to let that happen again. And so I think Denzel's mindset, you know, he's certainly very physically gifted, but I think that mindset is uh, a big part of his success as a corner. And I think that mindset is very pervasive throughout this defense, throughout all the guys we talked to. You heard a lot of unfinished business of we're, we're here to win a national championship of we need to dictate games. Uh, that was really the theme of the day from talking to those defensive players is we have to be dominant and, and we're here to, to win. And that's, that's why all these guys came back is, you know, they were already one of the best defenses in the country last year, but now the goal is to actually go win those games that matter, which is beating Michigan, winning the big 10 championship, winning a national championship. Right. And, you know, we, we talk about the questions that we have for the, for a defense like this, cause it's our job and, you know, it's, it's fun to discuss like, well, well where's Sonny Styles going to play? Where's CJ Hicks going to play? Is it a good idea to put Jack Sawyer, JT Tui Melo out at an outside linebacker? But I, I think, you know, it's important periodically too, to step back and appreciate how good this defense is going to be the expectations we have for this defense. We we've talked about it before, um, but, but it's just like, as this spring is ramping up here, I'd encourage fans too to just like really kind of appreciate what 
again, I think should be a generational defense this year and the pieces they have coming back and how that's going to then push the offense to get better. The other thing I appreciated too in, in this segment with Denzel is that he was willing to place similar expectations on himself as he was the team. You know, he was saying, yeah, I, I want to be the top cornerback taken in the draft. I want to win the Jim Thorpe Award as the best defensive back in the country. Like he, he has similarly high expectations for himself as he does uh, his teammates. And, you know, I think that re also is reflected in his assessment thus far of Will Howard. It's common this time of year to see guys just just talk up a teammate no matter what. But Denzel, with his honesty, is saying, hey, still need to see more from the transfer quarterback in this spring. What are your first impressions of Will Howard? Will Howard? Um, I don't know. I guess... You know, we still we only been two days of practice, so I guess, you know, we still got a lot of more days to go. But, you know, me, I'm going to just keep it real. Um, I still, you know, I want to see more continue to – I know he has a high potential, and um, I'm excited for him. And uh, 13 more, more practices, so we'll see. You mentioned Jerry Emick. He's standing in the background there like, uh-oh. <laughs> Is he heard, heard that <laughs> comment come? But, but you, you, you're right. Uh, Denzel, he always keeps it real. And I think that was a telling comment that a lot of times this time of year – guys it's always oh yeah that guy's great that guy's great that guy's great and he was like mm, I, gotta, I gotta see a little more now i don't think anyone should press the panic button yet it's only been two spring practices there's a long way to go between now and september but i do think that comment was a little bit of a, a dose of reality on will howard to where it's like if you're expecting him to come in and be justin field or to be cj stroud right away that might be setting the bar a little bit too high for what to expect from Will Howard. I mean, just based on what he did at Kansas State, it would take a significant jump for him to get from there to where, you know, those guys were as Heisman Trophy finalists, as elite quarterbacks who went on to be first round NFL draft picks. So that's not to say that he can't get there, but there's there's a long way to go for him to get there and i think that was reflected in denzel's comment and it is interesting that you know both practices we've been at so far at least while we've been there devin brown has been the guy getting the first reps at quarterback and so while i don't think either of us would change our opinion right now and say that we 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 don't think will howard will be the starting quarterback for 2024 this year Ohio State is certainly at least creating the appearance of a real quarterback competition here. And from what we've seen from Devin, I mean, we've only seen him throw routes on air. So we can't, we really haven't seen anything with our own eyes from Devin to really evaluate his growth. But so far, the, the, the reviews on Devin Brown have been positive to where if this is a real competition, he seems to be putting his best foot forward and doing what he needs to do so far to at least give Ryan Day and Chip Kelly something to think about. Yeah, um, and I think there were questions about Will Howard that I had that um, others had as a passer coming into Ohio State. It felt like an upgrade over McCord probably, but not like a huge jump guaranteed like he still there was more he needed to prove uh, from a passing perspective and. Clearly two spring practices in, he hasn't just come out of the gates and immediately shown that. Not to say he won't, but I, I think, like you said, Dan, it, it's helped temper some of the expectations, helped give a dose of reality of, hey, you know, this is a guy that's going to have to first earn the starting job and then take a bigger jump. I saw a uh, I saw an interesting stat out there the other uh, day that it it there is an expectation on transfer quarterbacks to be the starter obviously when they go to a new destination of the top fifteen quarterbacks in the twenty four seven sports transfer portal last year twelve did end up winning or being given the starting job at their next destination but there's still those three cases and um, sometimes guys surprise you and. I'm not going to write off what a year of development can look like under Ryan Day, given his track record. 
uh, perhaps even under Chip Kelly, given his involvement now in the quarterback room. Uh, so I, I think there is a path for Devin to make a serious push in this competition. And we've seen him lead these lines uh, the, pat, the first couple spring practices we've lo- watched. How much is it Will Howard even settling in, getting accustomed to the flow of things at Ohio State, maybe some early practice jitters because he knows he has to compete for and win this starting job. And there's a lot of stakes on it for him because it's his last college football season. Um, Who's to say? But um, I, I think there's definitely more intrigue now than I had previously in terms of maybe there's a chance this turns into a pretty real competition at quarterback. Now, the fact that Denzel does keep it real means that when he talks someone up, that also carries more weight. And he certainly did that when he was asked about Jeremiah Smith. This might be a big statement, but just the way he handles himself and the way he moves and what he had, the potential he has, I feel like he might be the next best receiver to come through here. And um, I'm really excited to see what he can do. And uh, the sky's the limit for him. That comment particularly resonated for me because when he was asked about Jeremiah Smith before a cotton ball, he basically said, I got to see bro in person. He wasn't going to buy into the hype of Jeremiah Smith being the number one overall recruit in his class until he actually lined up against him in practice. But it took only two spring practices for him to be saying, oh, this guy's going to be the next best receiver at Ohio State. The sky's the limit for this guy. And that echoes everything we've heard about Jeremiah Smith so far since he arrived at Ohio State. Everyone has been talking this guy up. You know, Ryan Day's had good things to say about him. We've heard the word freak used by pretty much everybody who's been asked about Jeremiah Smith. And so the expectations are sky high for this guy as a freshman, but it's like the they just keep adding more fuel to the hype train with, with everything that they're saying about him. And even just looking at him, I mean, this is a guy, he's already six three two fifteen. He just does not look like your typical wide receiver who should still be a senior in high school right now. He looks like he's ready to go play college football right now. And I've, 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 I've said it every time we've talked about Jeremiah, it's the polish for me. And I think from Denzel's comments, that's clear. He already has a certain way of not only carrying himself, but doing some of the things as a receiver, just outside your physical tools, route running hands, those kinds of things that take development, take time. Um, to He's already coming in with a lot of those things, and it's why he's going to be a factor at receiver for Ohio State this year. We both feel pretty confident about that. Uh, and, you know, as, as long as... Brian Hart lines in tow. This, these, these quarterbacks, whoever wins at quarterback is going to have uh, Jeremiah Smith and a lot of other weapons to throw to. Yeah, I'm just excited to see him actually like play. Uh, we, we haven't really seen any um, outside of routes on air. We haven't gotten to get our eyes on these receivers in that sort of versus a defensive back setting yet. So I, I'm really curious to watch Jeremiah in the open practices. We get to view the full practices and then in the spring game, um, just exactly how far along he is in this spring as a freshman. Because, you know, Carnell Tate got talked up a lot last spring too, and he did have an impact as a freshman, but he wasn't like a superstar last year. He had a role, but he wasn't, you know, he's, he's still got another step to take as a sophomore. Is Jeremiah Smith going to be a guy that could go out and have a, a big freshman season to where he's like, we're, we're talking like, 800 plus yards maybe or something like that i i I wonder what the ceiling is in year one for jeremiah smith just because you know it it makes sense with him being the consensus number one recruit with the polish we've discussed i've never heard a guy talked up this much in the spring and that's really saying something at ohio state where a freshman talked up this much i should say and that's really saying something at ohio state where everyone gets talked up well you say the ceiling. I think the ceiling is very high. I think the ce- I mean, the ceiling on a guy like Jeremiah Smith is extremely high. Now, you know, the, the, the floor should probably be lower than, than maybe people might think just because he is a true freshman. So, I mean, I don't think that there's necessarily a, a floor that should be assumed with a guy who's a freshman. But the ceiling is extremely high because this guy is a rare talent. I mean, I, I wouldn't personally predict right now that he's going to have 800 yards as a freshman because 
either way, you know, he's going to be splitting targets with the likes of Emeka, Buka, and Carnell Tate and Brandon Innes. And so if I was, you know, taking the over under on 800 yards, I would take the under on 800 yards. But uh, I, I do think that the possibilities here are high. We've heard that term sky's the limit used for him a couple times. I don't think that we should set a ceiling on what Jeremiah Smith can be as a freshman because he's a rare talent. There's just not a lot of guys who are as gifted as Jeremiah Smith is. And so because of that, he has the potential to do uncommon things that we don't typically see from an Ohio State freshman wide receiver. I'm just really excited to see him play, man. That's uh, I, I see someone like that in aren't person. It's just, aren't we all, right? Yeah. And see this, uh, see this Ohio State defense too as the spring unfolds here. Uh, not all sunshine and rainbows for Ohio State sports uh, this past week, Dan. I think uh, I think we, we kind of jinxed uh, Ohio State's women's basketball and hockey teams. Not uh, not not the exciting weekend that we were expecting, hope maybe hoping for from them. Um, the you know especially with the women's basketball team losing there in the quarterfinals of the Big Ten tournament in the fashion they did, but you know I think that's how it goes. I and mean, both those those sometimes you play good teams or even you know sometimes you don't get up for a game you need to get up for, and both those teams will be looking to bounce back in their respective uh, NCAA tournaments. But uh, it, I, I feel like we cursed them with, with how much we talked them up on last podcast, Dan. Yeah, we did. We did. We said it would be an exciting weekend for uh, those teams, and it, it did not turn out to be an exciting weekend for those teams. Uh, Ohio State women's basketball uh, playing really its worst game of a season by far, losing 82 to 61 to Maryland in its Big Ten t- tournament opener. Now, the good news is uh, they're still going to be hosting home games next weekend in the first and second round of the NCAA tournament. Uh, they're they're not going to be a number one seed anymore. They had a chance to earn a number one seed, and that's not going to happen as a result of that first game loss in Minneapolis. But they, they sh- they'll still be either a two or a three seed. Uh, it'll be interesting to see their draw. You know, I know I was looking at one bracket projection earlier this week, and Ohio State was projected as the number two seed in South Carolina's bracket, which. Uh, frankly, Ohio State would be better off getting a number three seed in one of the other brackets because South Carolina has not lost this year. And so that would be kind of a worst case scenario in terms of trying to get to a final four in Cleveland uh, to end up in South Carolina's bracket. But, you know, I mean, this is a team when, when they're at their best. I mean, I, I do believe when they are at their best, they are capable of beating anybody. Now, I think what we saw on Friday is also what can happen when they're playing at their worst, which, uh, you know, I think the, the big thing that you worry about with this team, I think right now in my mind is rebounding, uh, rebounding has been a problem for the Buckeyes all year. They've been one of the worst rebounding teams in the big 10. And it was a huge problem against Maryland as they were out rebounded 55 to 31 in that game. Uh, didn't have a good shooting game either. Went just 35.9% from the field. But, you know, that's going to happen. Every team's going to have off shooting games. You'd expect them to bounce back from that. The rebounding has been more of a persistent problem with this team. And most of the time when this team has lost games, it's been because they haven't been able to handle opponent size inside. And I think you, you couple that with some deficiencies we've seen in transition defense in the last couple of games. Uh, the, the fact that uh, the bench for this team has not uh, produced, I, I think, to the level that it, it, it's going to need to, to make a really deep run in the NCAA tournament. And I, I think, uh, you know, there's some, uh, you know, concerns for this team heading into the NCAA tournament. I think, you know, we, we were just talking about ceiling and floor. You know, I think the ceiling of this team is, winning the national championship, like anything's possible for this team when they are at their best, they are capable of beating anybody. But, you know, where's the floor? I mean, the floor could be getting upset in the second round. Like, I think uh, a lot of that's going to depend on just how well you play. And granted, that's true for most teams in either gender in the NCAA tournament. Um, So it's not necessarily anything unique uh, to Ohio State in this situation, but certainly you know, a lot of a talk going into that first game against Maryland was we have to re- see how we respond to a loss and we have to take things one day at a time. And well, they certainly didn't respond to the loss the way you would hope, that being the previous loss against Iowa. And it certainly didn't look like they were fully focused on one day at a time because it looked like 
they went into that Maryland game expecting to win. And uh, the, the other team, you know, we talked about desperation for the men in terms of that Ohio State versus Iowa game. Maryland went into that game not necessarily a lock to make the NSA tournament. So they were the team that was playing with more to play for. And it showed in the way that game was played. And so now having, you know, basically two weeks in between games before they'll play their first game of the NCAA tournament, uh, either next Friday or Saturday, uh, certainly plenty for them to work on and, uh, you know, make sure that they respond in a better way uh, as they get into the games that uh, truly matter the most. Yeah, uh, I'll be looking for that bounce back from the uh, women's basketball team. Also from the women's hockey team, you know, did reach the uh, WCHA championship game, but lost their 6-3 on Saturday to Wisconsin. 6-1 before the final five minutes, so a little more lopsided than even that score, uh, which three goals is plenty of margin in a hockey game. But Ohio State still landed the number one overall seed in the NCAA tournament. Uh, there's a good chance they'll have to beat Wisconsin in order to win a second national championship there under Nadine. Uh, you know, the Buckeyes have now lost two in a row against the Badgers, although they beat them three times earlier this year. I think that it's, it's always, again, you talk about momentum, you want momentum entering the NCAA tournament and uh, coming off a loss is never what you want. But uh, then again, you know, this is a team that's a achieved higher heights than anyone thought imaginable after, before Nadine Musserall got there. Um, and so I, I, I'll be curious to see how they respond. You know, they're, they're going to get either UConn or Minnesota Duluth in the NCAA quarterfinals because they have a bye as the number one overall seed. I, I think that they, they obviously have the talent as the best number one team in the country. The thing about hockey too, is that it, it's hard to predict how an individual game is going to go a lot of times. This is a sport kind of similar to baseball or uh, soccer. And sometimes in that regard of there's not a lot of individual scoring, like in terms of just the number of, of scoring plays there are in a game. And when you have sports like that, generally the manipulations can be really small and, and freaky in terms of who wins and who loses a game, how a game looks or turns into a blowout. And so that's, that's why we, you, you talk about the, the national championship in women's hockey comes down to one game. It's not a series. And then that, that uh, sort of plays a major role in is how wild tournaments can be. I mean, even in the NHL, the Stanley Cup playoff is known as one of the biggest parody tournaments in all of sports up there, even with March Madness in some people's eyes. And those are seven game series. So um, it's always been one of my favorite things about hockey, Dan. Uh, but I'll be I'll be interested to see how the women bounce back in uh, in the NCAA tournament this week. Yeah, and I think that game on Saturday, I mean, I was watching the game and I think, you know, early on in that game, Ohio State was out playing Wisconsin. Like they had more shots on goal in the first 10 minutes than Wisconsin did, but they let a couple soft goals go through. Wisconsin takes a 2 nothing lead, and I think it just kind of all fell apart from Ohio State from there. And, you know, this is a team that kind of like the women's team, they haven't faced a lot of adversity. In most games, they go out there, they dominate. They don't have a ton of experience playing from behind. And I think that showed in this game to where when Wisconsin got a got an early lead, it, it just kind of snowballed from there. And, and Ohio State, you know, was not really able to, to bounce back uh, from, from getting – you know, hit early and, and falling into that early two goal deficit. And so I think certainly, again, it's going to be about how does this team respond, but you know, they're more than capable of, of winning a national championship They're You know, like you said, hockey, there's a, there's a small margin for error in this sport. Uh, and we saw that last year, they were the number one team and they lost to Wisconsin in the national championship game. So good chance. We will see a rematch between those two teams. I think they are pretty clearly the two best teams in college women's hockey this year. But like you said, it's a parody sport. Anything can happen. Uh, we will see what happens on Saturday uh, at 4 p.m. at the OSU Ice Rink when Ohio State will host either Minnesota Duluth or UConn in the NCAA quarterfinals. So a uh, busy time for Ohio State sports. No spring football practice this week, but they'll be back at it next week. So we'll have uh, plenty more to talk about from an Ohio State football perspective next week. But We'll, of course, also be talking a lot about Ohio State basketball as uh, we will know at this time next week whether or not Ohio State has done enough to make the NCAA tournament. 
Uh, and if they do, uh, then we will certainly have a lot to talk about there on the men's side, as well as, of course, knowing that uh, the women will be in the NCAA tournament and maybe women's hockey will be in a frozen four next week. So plenty going on in Ohio State sports. Uh, we'll be covering it all here on Real Pod Wednesdays, and we hope you join us again next week.